Alors, welcome to a new special series of our podcast dedicated to the Olympic Games in Tahiti. We interview for you some of the protagonists of this Olympic adventure. Hello, welcome to the ninth and final episode of this Olympic series. Today we talk about a very important topic. We talk about parasurfing and the necessity to bring parasurfing to the Olympic Games in 2028 in California. We discussed with Victoria Fage about this important mission, parasurfing and uh, new developments and much more. Hello, Victoria, since you are in uh, Hawaii, but uh, how are you? Where are you today? How things are going? I am great. I'm excited to be here. Yes, I'm calling and speaking from Hawaii, and it is a beautiful day here on the North Shore. Fantastic. You know, we, we all love Hawaii. It's the dream uh, land uh, for every surfer in the planet. Uh, and um, today we're going to talk about... Uh, uh, many things. Uh, so we are in the Olympic series, uh, uh, and so we have to uh, to remind everyone, and we will tell during this during this interview many times to join the petition to have parasurfing in the Olympic Games in Los Angeles, two thousand twenty-eight. Did I say it right? Yes. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, parasurfing is surfing with someone with a physical disability and surfing is in the Olympics and surfing is the state sport of California. And parasurfing uh, has been accepted by the ISA and the International Paralympic Committee to be in the Paralympics, but it was declined by the LA 28 organizing committee due to cost. And we are running a petition to address the cost barrier together to find a way if this is the only obstacle like we are parasurfers we can take on the ocean with our disabilities we can find a way to make this happen as well so please sign the petition i did a little a video with kelly slater who's lent his support and we need ten thousand signatures and we're halfway there with five thousand so please go online maybe there'll be a link in the podcast uh uh, recording for the petition, but it's save parasurfing for the LA Paralympics. Those are the keywords to Google, but you can also check me out on social media and there will be links or maybe something in the podcast. But yes, we can. I'm hoping surfers as a community can come together to help us because I think surfing is in the Olympics and parasurfing is exciting and belongs in the Paralympics. Yeah, it does. It took uh, quite a while. Uh, the episode before you is the one with Fernando Guerra that is telling us uh, the story of uh, how long did it take for him to get surfing in the Olympic. So it was already uh, like uh, a challenge. But now mm. that surfing is in, there cannot be an excuse about money. Uh, it should be really like, uh, uh, or a reason for somebody else. I don't want to create pole uh, polemic, but uh, I know that the budgets are not infinite, uh, but... Uh, we should uh, uh, fight for, for what we think is right. So the surf community uh, usually is very, it gets very tight yes. together. Yeah, it's it very close-knit community. Oh, because we understand each other. It's, it's um, like that only a surfer knows the feeling that, I mean, it's something that we love so much. We change our jobs and our locations and we chase surfing. And to be able to surf in the Paralympics, to showcase our strength and skill, I mean, would be an absolute dream come true. And there really is, we think that if we get the Paralympics, we can showcase the value of it in terms of millions in earned media value and millions and millions of of social media uh, shares and impressions. And so we think we can find a way together. No, yeah. it's a, it's a, okay. It's like kind of a trade, you know, to give a, to give back something. But I think the right way is to do it because it's the right thing, you know, no matter what, even if there is one spectator that watches it, it's the right thing to do. And uh, Oh, actually, I think we'll have more than that. We did our, <laughs> uh, we, we did our last ISA at Huntington Beach, and it was really a trial run for the Paralympics, and it was wildly successful. We had the most viewership online and, the, and like, parade through the town, and people... And the neighborhood were asked, coming up and asking us if we were competing, what, what, when the finals were. And it, you got the sense that it was more, 
people are genuinely interested and so curious. I mean, surfing with a prosthetic leg, how do you surf if you're in a wheelchair on land? Like, how do you surf if you're visually impaired or blind? Like, it's inherently interesting and exciting. I mean, then you, yeah, so we'll we'll get some crowds for sure. In, a, in effect, I, there are bird, birds, uh, noises everywhere, but that's their nature, right? <laughs> yes, I, I do live uh, outside of Haleiwa and... I apologize for the sound quality, uh, but nice. those are birds. <laughs> it's nice, you know, just for the people that wondering what are those noises is like, uh, because uh, I guess there are many birds over there. But nevertheless, when I I spoke with Christian Otter Bailey uh, for the Tokyo Olympics, uh, we, we, we went into the discussion of uh, uh, like in um, uh, surfing, longboarding, shoreboard, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there is as well. Uh, in parasurfing, a difference, you know, between athletes uh, with one condition or another condition. And so uh, is not maybe good, I don't know, or fair I have, to have one competing with each other. So there should be some classification, right? Well, there is. There's a, actually, that's part of the reason that I think we're so gutted as parasurfers is that we have such a robust classification system where people with approximately the same level of impairment or function are surfing against each other. And our classification system has like scientific publications that validate its 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 effect like efficacy. So we know that it's it's fair and we know that it meets the Paralympic criteria and standards. Um and because surfing is the state sport of California and that also yeah. with LA 28 is using surfing in their Olympic, but also Paralympic marketing. That's why we were so uh, devastated that we were left out because, yes, we do need a good classification system, but we already have that. We've met every single criteria except for the cost barrier. So we're doing this petition to find a way together the motto of la 28 is together like just give us a chance to try to raise the money to to really make it possible uh and i think that if we get enough signatures with the petition and enough surfer support and general support we can really make this happen my understanding is that they are aware of the petition and that they're actually revisiting the decision or at least having some meetings about it uh later this month so there's really a potential for for success we just need your support please sign the petition yes mm -hmm. it, there are real complexities but uh, we can address them together like we can problem solve the ocean with the disabilities we have like we can find a way to do this as well i'm sure we have all to find a way together and uh, uh, one note about uh, the petition is that the petition is just an uh, electronic signature is not a donation right it's right very important too so if people think like, okay, shall I donate something? Well, the beginning of everything is just you put your name and you just uh, support the petition. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes. I, absolutely. If I can say clearly, we are not asking for donations. We are just asking for signatures. The website change.org is a little bit convoluted or a little bit... Um, clunky and so you just have to skip the donation part we are not asking for donations we just want to show show our support and yes so if you can sign the petition that would be amazing cool uh, but five thousand in uh like what one week 10 days less than that uh it, the petition started with josh vogel who's a friend and also a parasurfer and a lot of us were kind of so demoralized that we didn't really do anything. And and then I last Thursday, I did the Tahui paddle race, uh, where you paddle from sunset to Waimea. And I just did it on my short board because I didn't have like a long board. <laughs> uh, but then it was such a great community vibe. It was so fun. And Kelly Slater was there and Jack Johnson and a, a bunch of pro surf community members. And I thought, you know, it's worth just an ask. Like, I'm not, I don't want to impose on their time, but they're surfers. They understand. And the fact that we made every single requirement for the Paralympics, except for cost. So I asked for their help if they would do a video and lend their support. And they were both so kind and generous to do that. And once Kelly Slater got on board, it gave us momentum. And in 
a couple days, we got the 5,000 and we're getting more. There's a video with Jack Johnson. Uh, we're, we're getting, we're getting that, but when we know that more para surfers have more videos with other pro surfers and we're, we're building this together. Uh, so we're hoping to get the 10,000 within, within the week or within, uh, probably the next before the beginning, before the middle of the month. Uh, and it's a doable, it's an absolute reasonable goal. So once I got that video, it kind of, it gave us momentum. But we also find that it's people's friends and families, like the personal connections you have, or if you understand the story that we actually met every single criteria. But the reason we think that the cost may be higher is that surfing is an outdoor sport and many Paralympic sports are an indoor controlled environment. And so we think that because the Olympic site will be set up and then the Paralympics happens two weeks later, that LA thought they would have to tear down the event site and then reset it back up again um, with beach marshal and judging and priority. And we do know the estimated cost from the ISA. It's not, it's not crazy. Like it's two hundred thousand dollars. Like we we can make that happen. But we think that if they didn't understand that we can be flexible, or maybe we can run the whole Paralympics directly after the Olympics and not have to tear down the event site and just keep it up as is, that's an, another option to make it more affordable and more, more efficient. Because we recognize budgets are important, but if that's the only cost, if that, that's the only barrier to get us in the Paralympics after everything we've been through, like, let's work together to find a better solution. It's $5 for, uh, I don't know, 20,000 20, surfers uh, all over the world uh, or not. Five dollars for forty thousand surfers all over there. Ah, right, right, yeah. Collectively, we could do it. And, um, and I, I think I should say that um, I am a wheelchair user on land. I became a wheelchair user from a snowboarding accident when I was eighteen. I always grew up doing board sports, skateboarding, snowboarding, so much in Canada, and also surfing in Canada. And when you love the rush and you love the mountains and you love the ocean like that doesn't change when you get injured so when i crushed a vertebrae doing uh, really over over sending a method grab i became a wheelchair user but i went back to all of those sports i became a sit skier i i skateboard on my knees i surf on my knees and that's why i'm a para surfer but i have moved to hawaii to become a better surfer to to reach my surfing potential because when i first got injured i didn't know anybody else who had an injury, who went in the water or went surfing. I just did it because I loved it. It wasn't until I met the adaptive surf or the parasurf community who compete and really push themselves and love it. And they're kind of crazy in all the best ways. Then I really found my community. And I think that if other people saw what we can do in the ocean, it's, it's not just going straight in the white wash. It's snaps, it's barrels, it's kicking up spray. Like it's exciting. And the stories of people's injuries and comebacks are, are so wild and moving that I think there's so much potential to market parasurfing in a way that will cover the costs. So maybe somebody out there, uh, maybe some uh, billionaire guy will decide to post $200,000 uh, bill and to uh, sustain the parasurfing by himself. I think like it's so, so important, you know, that people with disabilities or people without disabilities they are looking at surfing in this case but it can be any other discipline can be tennis or basketball uh, i don't know uh, fencing or whatnot uh, with uh, um, finding inspiration to overcome difficulties right is uh is absolutely of stories of human being that mm -hmm. have found difficulties in their path some other people have uh, other kind of difficulties, financial difficulties or life difficulty, losses of uh, uh, people dear to us, losses of uh, children or sons or daughters. Uh, but the human being doesn't stop to the difficulty, goes beyond the difficulty, isn't it? Absolutely. I think that's the power of, of surfing. And whether you have a disability or not, everybody struggles with their set of issues. And when I'm in the water, I feel free and alive and the most myself. And it's a way of washing off 
everything that we carry. It, it is powerful. And because the ocean is equalizing, there's no tokenism in the ocean. There's no social treatment. If we catch those waves, or if you catch that wave and you have a good turn or a good sick barrel, those memories, those, that feeling, it sustains you through some of the harder times in your life, or at least for me. I usually start the podcast with uh, a question that I ask everyone. And uh, in, uh, now we are almost 15 minutes into the podcast, but no problem. What is the most important thing in surfing, in your opinion? Whoa. Um, the most important thing in surfing for me is the connection with the ocean. And also, by extension, the connection with yourself. It's just what I spoke about. I like who I am in the water. I feel the most free in most myself, especially on land. People see me as a wheelchair user, and that comes with a whole set of assumptions about what I can or cannot do. I feel oftentimes I'm a screen onto which people project whatever it is they want to see, a, a inspiration or a tragedy or a cautionary tale of women in adventure, extreme sports. And when I'm in the ocean and I'm paddling, it, it's like everything drops away and I just feel part of nature and I feel the most myself and that is inherently liberating and empowering so I don't know <laughs> that's it's a hard question oh yeah but it depends you know can be very easy just like have fun or can be different to the way you know so I like uh, it, it is fun it is so fun but it's also it's so much more than just fun it can be technical <laughs> uh, for instance like the the conventional wetsuits that allow people to surf in cold water or, uh, yeah, cold, cold water. <laughs> and one oh, well, I, will, I will shout out, the, yeah, having, especially as a Canadian surfer, <laughs> uh, having a solid wetsuit has changed my surfing experience. And actually, that's why I got picked up by Rip Curl for sponsorship, because their wetsuits were so warm and flexible that even with my lower leg paralysis, I could get in and out of a wetsuit relatively quickly and stay warm as opposed to wearing something thinner and then getting hypothermic. <laughs> um, yeah, it's equipment matters. And oh, that's the other thing with parasurfing. The boards are cool. I mean, there's knee boards. There's adaptations to deal with like a prosthetic leg. Like if you if you ride a regular glass surfboard with a prosthetic leg and you just like stomp it too hard, like sometimes you could stomp the prosthetic leg through the board. <laughs> So there are adaptations to make sure that the board can can help us showcase what we can do in the water. Um, it's pretty cool. I had one question about the board, but before that, did we remember people to sign the petition? Yes, we're asking <laughs> again. We're asking for your help. You personally, you and your friends and family, because yes, we are getting social media attention, but the truth is that it's individual people listening to this story or, or caring about us, about parasurfing. It's individual people just like you signing the petition that are making the numbers go up. It's one signature at a time and we're getting there, but we could really use your help. So please sign the petition. Links are in the information. Yes. And by the time this episode will be live, so during the Olympic Games, uh, maybe there will be 100,000 signatures and then finally you know that would be amazing because if we can show that people are interested and care the more people sign the petition the stronger argument we have and if we can find a, a company or a business to partner with to help sponsor parasurfing or to 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 be a liaison with the la uh, organizing committee we want to find a way to to address the cost barrier in a way that is a good solution for everyone. So, but yes, first step is just sign the petition. You don't have to donate anything. Just sign your name and spread the word because we can, we can do it together. Definitely we can. And so going back to uh, equipment, surfboards and wetsuits, since we talk about wetsuits, how is the research going into, um, into these uh, tools uh, that uh, every surfer needs? Obviously to surf. How is it for for parasurfing? We were talking about wetsuit, for instance. Is mm -hmm. that specific uh, research behind, or how does it work? I am 
analytical by nature. <laughs> and uh, I actually, my, my background is I'm a trained physiotherapist. And so I have that kind of like, uh, that kind of brain. But everything I've learned in surfing, honestly, with wetsuits or fins or boards has been trial and error. And then speaking with other uh, adaptive surfers and figuring out what works for them. But because the disabilities can be a little bit different, because I have an incomplete spinal cord injury, I surf on my knees. But I also surf in the same category as someone who's lost a leg um, above the knee. And so they also surf in a kneeling position, but the board adaptations are very different. Uh, there's a, an amazing Australian surfer who inspires me named Mark Mono Stewart. And he has a really deep groove in his surfboard that he's shaped himself essentially where that where his his leg goes in and then there's a bit of a pad on the other side where his stump goes and it gives him more support and control and then the fins are moved up quite a bit like six to eight inches than a regular fin cluster on a regular stand-up shortboard because it, you kind of want the fins underneath your center of gravity and and have better control for pivot points and better maneuverability See, I'm getting into it now. I like, I love, I love this stuff. And then the size of the fin oh. and if it's quad or if it's thruster, like all of these factors matter. And because, because all, so many of us are, are pioneers of, of, a, of parasurfing, we've just been figuring it out ourselves. And then you go to contests and it's like, you see your friends again and you get to talk about boards and talk about what works and what doesn't. And that's one of the things I love about the community. We really all want to win, but we all help each other too. But it, it, the boards are pretty spectacular, especially for a prone category where people are lying down. Uh, the fins can be moved up sometimes a couple feet up the board. And who's shaping your surfboard? Is like, do you have like particular uh, shaper or? I, for a long time, I bought off the shelf surfboards because I was working uh, full time, and it seemed crazy to to justify the cost of a custom board. But I w was training and surfing and winning a lot of contests. I have actually won five consecutive ISA world titles, and for my women's kneel division, I've won like fifteen straight contests. But it's it's not because I'm crazy competitive. It's because I love to surf, and I never thought I could at this level. So it's a dream to come true, a dream come true to progress. Uh, but now I'm starting to get custom knee boards shaped by Erica Wakawa. And I recently have a board shaped by John Pizel based on the white tiger that I just love. And I'm doing my best turns in Australia and Japan. Like it, this board is awesome, but it's taken years to, to, to get there. And then, I mean, I recognize to some degree what works for my body, but there's so much I don't know about shaping and, and so speaking with these icons of our sport is an absolute honor and a pleasure and working with a good shaper has not just made me more skilled in the water it's like i'm less disabled it's really it's pretty cool does that make sense like the boards matter a lot uh, of course when i spoke with uh jeff timponi uh, he's a shaper in hawaii he told me with almost 50 with more than 50 years experience he told me there are like 51 something apart of a surfboard. And each one, if you change one, has a consequence on the other, you know? Absolutely. So in, uh, it's about weight distribution, right? So if you are, if you're a para surfer, as we said before, not all of them are the same, right? So mm -hmm. also you need to change this weight distribution according to uh, the disability and, uh, you were talking about uh, two legends, John Faisal and Erika Arakawa, that are not just name, glorious name in the surf industry. I interviewed both of them. They are just amazing person. Right? They're so nice and kind and generous. And uh, frankly, I was a bit intimidated to speak with them because I'm kind of, you know, an adaptive surfer from Canada who now lives on the North Shore. But I wasn't sure how they would respond to me as a wheelchair girl surfer. And they have been so generous and so kind and instrumental in helping me succeed, not just in competition, but in my free surfing and, and feeling excited about the progression. 
So I just want to thank them, um, especially the last board with John Pizel, honestly, has been just by far my best performances in the last four months. And it's this, it's it's me for sure, but it's also the board. It's the connection between all of it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I love how humble is your approach. You are a five-time world champion and you are saying I'm just a Canadian girl uh, uh, coming to Erika Warakawa or John Pizel. You made a huge success out of uh, her. I thank you. I don't know what to say. I, 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 I guess I'll say this. Um, I, I love surfing. When I got injured, the two things that I was just gutted about, like devastated that I would never really do again or have in my life were backcountry skiing, like alpine touring and, and surfing. Because how are you going to get over the sand? You need strength and skill in the water. And I knew I could swim and I could, but I never thought I'd surf at a high level. And now getting to the point where I can oh my god get barrels like this is amazing and really do good bottom turns and top turns and and work on technique and work with coaches and i have it in my life in a way that i never dreamed and so i feel lucky but i also just want to be honest that i come from a flat water city and i am i started to progress in my 30s like it's it's not a typical surf story and so i recognize that i because I am so different and I'm, I'm new on the North Shore, um, people are getting used to me as that girl who crawls over the sand, pushing her board, and then surfs Hala Eva all the time. <laughs> uh, but I recognize that I'm still an outsider. And I mean, same thing with parasurfing. Like, we're so close. But in many ways, we didn't get the Paralympics because we're still new and we're still an outsider. And so that's why we're asking for surf industry support, asking for your support, asking to sign the petition. Because we really do love it. And there's so much spectacular surfing and spectacular so- stories to showcase in parasurfing. Um, but I, I don't think that we've reached our potential whatsoever. Um, but if we get the Paralympics, without a doubt, we can showcase snaps and barrels and some pretty exciting surfing. I'm a very genuine person. So sometimes I say things and then I like bite my tongue because I, I say like, why I'm saying so now I just throw what is in my mind and then you tell me. Uh, I think, you know, surfing is an inclusive culture. Yeah, right. And I think that the Olympics are a good window opportunity to showcase a sport like surf. Before Tokyo was not existing, now it's existing. The Olympic Games are seen by a mil- billions of people. So, well, uh, there is surf and is, uh, and is nice. We have surf and skateboard for that. Kind of late <laughs> in, the, in the Duke dream, but nevertheless important. Yeah. So, Olympic Games are an opportunity. You know? But when you're saying, like, if I were understood that we need to be there in order to be recognized. Yes. Maybe parasurfing can be recognized much earlier than 2028. I would love that. Uh, there was a, so I love the North Shore. And I guess part of the reason I'm, I'm humble up here is that, whoa, the waves are for real. It is powerful. And I never want to be saved by the, by the lifeguards. I want to challenge myself and push, but I also want to respect the North Shore, respect the surf culture up here, respect Hawaiian culture and be part of it. I, one of the best moments of being part of it is that there's a, my favorite contest is at Haleiwa. It's called the Haleiwa International Open and it's run by Joel Centio. And there are adaptive heats or, or, or parasurf heats within the larger surf competition. And so we're totally integrated and surfers, we have more in common than we have different. So we're talking about boards and, and fins and <laughs> what kind of bikinis stay on in the surf. Like, <laughs> It's amazing to feel equal. And that contest, because we're integrated, it, it feels like we're equal. And we, we have the Hawaiian Water Patrol just like any other heat. And it's, you feel valued when you feel equal and you feel that legitimacy. And I am hoping that more surf contests um, at, will integrate adaptive surfers, para surfers into their larger contests. We do have an adaptive world tour, 
uh, called the Adaptive ASP that has four stops, the prize money, priority, judging, live streams, if the event site can handle, can afford it. And it is a personal dream of mine to, to one day at like QS contests or even challenger series do a showcase heat or showcase or one day work with established surf competitions to to showcase what we can do before 2028 that would be amazing um but a step one for me has just been working on this petition like night and day <laughs> over the last <laughs> the last four days like literally i went to bed at 3 a.m last night because uh, i'm speaking with people in australia so it's it's been yeah i know but i would love to do that if you, if you have any any ideas of how we can do that i am all ears I know the feeling of talking with people in Australia because uh, all the time, you know, we, I'm in the middle and I'm talking with US, Hawaii, Australia, and sometimes like I just cross the agenda and I don't, <laughs> I don't remember what time is it. But, you know, look at the, for instance, the Pipeline Master, Pipeline Pro Master, like what, three years ago, it opened mm-hmm. to, right? And yeah. Think about it. It was just like, why they even need to open to women was not supposed to be the case already right oh. right and mm-hmm. they actually why is still not open you know and then finally they did and uh, uh and then it was so exciting like that he i got to watch that he in person live between uh, betty lou sakura and justin and and molly picklin like that was spectacular and those type of heats change did the trajectory change the history, change people's thoughts and opinions about what women's surfing could be. And in a, in the similar kind of vein, if we can showcase what parasurfing can do with clips or in good waves that l- allow us to have like real neck and neck competition like that, that will help push our sport forward and, and showcase to people how exciting um, it can be. Um, and I am ex- I'm so excited to watch Tahiti. Like uh, <laughs> the heat between uh, Hina and uh, Tari was just like that was insane. Like that was just it was so exciting. And there was going to be so many moments in the Olympics that, I mean, that's that's the, the power of the Olympics. It's a huge stage. Stakes are so high. Everybody's watching, and you get these hero moments or these moments of drama and competition that are so compelling. And we want to be part of it by adding Parasurf to the Paralympics. And we are so close, but we need more signatures. Yes, join the petition. <laughs> we remind it again. I think like two years ago, something like that, I spoke with Lauren Halil of uh, uh, Australia. Right. Asking her what is next to achieve in women surfing. And I think, I think it was her. And she, her reply was visibility. Really? And yeah, I think so. If I'm not uh, mistaken, I did so many interviews that, but I think it was there. Uh, um, yeah, I think so. Uh, and visibility gives, creates that kind of mechanism, of course, mm. of inspiring people, you know, uh, inspiring women in countries where uh, being out there in a surfboard is not. Uh, are seen as uh, proper. For instance, I had a discussion with Ishita Malaiwa. She's Indian uh, from India. India. Uh, yeah, right. Oh, she cool. She said, like, going on a surfboard uh, it, from our culture is not acceptable for a woman. Right. So having her surfing inspires other Indian women to be on a surfboard. Uh, being a woman surfing can inspire a young girl in uh, California up to China to go and try to, to surf. A five-time world champion like you uh, <laughs> can pro surf, um, pro surfer because yeah, pro surfer uh, uh, can inspire you know other surfers with disabilities to try you know or or person with disability to try. I, I agree. I agree. Like when I hear those stories about the women in India or I, I it's inspiring. It's inspiring for me. And it, it's, it's like an energy you get that this is possible, that we can do this, that it's, I, I hope 
that I can inspire people. When I was younger, I would have issues with the word, but now I understand that like I have done something that's unusual and I've done it purely because I love it and I have it so much grit <laughs> and maybe no common sense. But I I didn't get there alone. Like I got there from other people. And I I mean, watching Rochelle Ballard's barrel technique is iconic for me and watching Steph and Carissa. And I've got the pleasure to meet both of them. And they are both so lovely. And their surfing is inspiring. And there I had an amazing pleasure to meet at the Byron Bay Adaptive Contest, a personal hero, like like real personal hero, Pauline Menzer, who is the 1993 women's world champ. Um, and she did it with very little to no sponsorship with, with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, with, with joint pain and, and real physical issues. In my opinion, she is the first adaptive surfer, first para surfer. And she, she inspires me. It, it, I read her book, which is out now. It's amazing. And I watched Girls Can't Surf because... And I've watched it again and again. And usually I don't like rewatch movies, but this story about the beginning of the women's ASP tour and surfing in waves that were not, a, not great and very little prize money and very little tension and trying to work together to promote the sport and showcase what they can do. It resonates because it's so much what, what the adaptive surf or the parasurf community is trying to do, pull together to surf in better waves and showcase the level of skill and you can't see it. Uh, you can't be it if you can't see it. And so the visibility matters. So I hope that that I do give people an energy to 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 really chase their dreams because it's possible. Like it's hard, but it's also very doable. And every once in a while, I get really cool messages on Instagram or by email, being like, "Hey, I started surfing after my injury because of you." And it's like that. That's worthwhile. That there's power in that, you know. More it has more power in that than winning contests. Actually, for me, <laughs> when you can change people's life, it's uh, yes, yes, it's beyond. I don't know. It's meaningful. Yeah, and, and that's the power of the Paralympics. Is that because it's such a big stage, you can change people's perception so much because so many Paralympic sports are indoors in a controlled environment. And the reason I love surfing is that it's outdoors in an uncontrolled environment and you have to navigate the ocean. And that's, it's exciting in a way that an indoor sport will, will be exciting in the same way. That's what's unique and uniquely marketable about parasurfing is, is the ocean element. But it's also the logistical challenge of it and it increases the cost. And so we're trying to showcase that we can help address the cost barrier. We can, we can, we're worthwhile. We are worth the cost of the Paralympics for parasurfing in LA 28. I have no doubt. And I hope, uh, I hope people out there, the, the big guys uh, behind the chair, they will uh, decide accordingly. It's so nice to see like the nature is waking up around you. <laughs> from the... like, do you like the roosters? Cause they're just saying hello. I've learned though, they just, they just crow whenever they're feeling themselves. Like now, it has nothing to do with the dawn up here. <laughs> it's early morning, uh, and so they want to uh, show that I'm alive. Can I ask what started? What what made you start surfing? What made you keep surfing? Because everyone's got surf injuries. Everyone's got a busy schedule in life. Like what pushes you to keep going? For me, the this the stoke of being in the water. Yeah. That energy that nobody gives you back, like nobody can give you except surfing. Right, I agree. Water element, of course, but for me, swimming in a pool uh, or swimming in the ocean is not like waiting for a wave that mm. most of the time I don't catch, sometimes I catch, but that doesn't matter, you know, it's the one I catch that is important, you know? And so, um, so yes, that's, so that's, the, that's the feeling is unique, uh, like any. Every, every surfer knows the feeling, but uh, it's, uh, for me, it's also the, the culture behind. So uh, surfing with Aloha, that comes really from Hawaii, if you want to say. The fact that surf culture is so powerful, and that's the reason why I started this podcast, because uh, surfing is just like a very young sport. It started in the 1966, competitive. 
I hope at the field before a while, you know, Peru, yeah, and Chinese people tell me that no, I started like uh, yes, competitive is like so it's a very young sport, and so I I want I wanted to give my contribution for the surfers that maybe fifty years from now they will listen to these interviews and and, uh, and listening to world champions or shapers or people that just love sport like we do. Oh, I love it. It's beautiful. I agree. It's, it's the stoke, it's the connection, it's the aloha, the community. It's so much. Beautiful. I'm very uh, conscious of the time, careful of the time, so I don't want to steal so much from you. Um, I have a very stupid question at this stage, but I really wanted to say because I can bite my tongue. Is there any woman that won more than five or championship in Parasur? Uh, not yet. <laughs> um, um, uh, the goal of parasurfing. Uh, I there are okay. There are in certain because there's different classifications. There's surfing with a prosthetic leg, and then there's surfing in a kneeling position, and that's my category: surfing in a kneeling position. And just like you said, that it's a new sport. Like we're gaining more and more surfers every day. Like seriously. Every couple of days, I get contacted by a new para server who wants advice on boards, and we pay it forward, of course. And so, I, I have won five world titles for the ISA, and I've won so many contests in a row. But I think that when we get more and more people involved, that it's you're going to get a higher level of competition. It's going to be more competitive, and. I am proud of my achievements, but if I can help other people feel free and alive and compete in the ocean, that is, that's valuable for me as well. Like Philippe um, Kizu Lima in wave ski is amazing. And I think he's won five. And Bruno um, Hansen, uh, who surfed in prone division, has also won five. I am the only woman so far to win five uh, consecutively. Um, and hopefully a six if everything goes well in Huntington. Um, but it's also true that I like, I am a physio by trade and I really did like, I researched paddling mechanics and I went to the pool late at night in a flat water city and I worked on my paddling and now my paddling is pretty good. And my duck dives, I learned to duck dive in a pool. And then I would watch so much WSL to learn timing and positioning and where to turn on the wave and priority i've i've studied surfing because i love it and i've studied surfboards and design and fins like it's it's a it's a labor of love and because i am obsessed i think that my 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 success is partly due to that love and the obsession of it but um i also want other people to join the sport it's not it's more than it's more than just a competition it's if people don't want to competitively surf, that's a para surf. That's totally fine. But I want them to know they can have it in their life. And for people who do want to progress in para surfing, I want there to be a real pathway. And the Paralympics gives us that with federal funding and sponsorship opportunities and a, a chance to showcase on the largest stage. And I think that if LA 28 can see what we can offer, then we can work together to address the cost barriers because I recognize cost is a real factor. But let us work together. The motto for LA 28 is together. Like, let us try together to find a way. If we can, I do mean it, like, if we can problem solve how to get back in the ocean with all of our disabilities and, like, rip, we can find a way with this, too. I totally agree. So sign the petition, sign the petition, sign the petition. First, last uh, six questions, please answer the first thing that comes up to your mind, okay? A lot. Same question for everyone on the show. The best surfboard that you ever rode? Oh, my custom knee board, the white tiger that's been adapted for me by John Pizel. I am having my best turns and really having the best time on it. I, is Having a surfboard that's custom to you is being amazing. So this is my magic board. But what I really want is to get a board that's similar but foiled out for like breech spray barrels or like powerful waves for this winter because oh i can't wait so um, as you can tell i'm quite excited about the things to come and um i just wanted to say thank you for your time thank you for 
for supporting Parasurfing. Thank you for promoting our petition. And I hope if you get a chance to come to Hawaii, we can surf together. Yeah, of course, is the minimum I can do, but there are still five more very quick. So, oh, oh, wow. Well, here we go. Uh, okay, rapid fire. <laughs> that was not rapid fire. Okay, I'm ready. I take compliments, no problem. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, favorite, wo- uh, favorite woman surfer of all time? Steph Gilmore. Personal question. Your favorite song or kind of music? Oh, Ramble On by Led Zeppelin. Wow, it goes fast. Both, both to listen to and to play on guitar. Oh, oh wow. Okay, good. Um, so we, now we know that you play guitar. <laughs> uh, favorite surf spot if it's not a secret? I love Haleiwa because it, I love Haleiwa. I also love Lani Ikea. Lani's is great too. Honestly, Hawaii is great. <laughs> Although I do love Canada. Tofino is where I learned and it will always have my heart. Yeah, Canada surfing. <laughs> That's great. Favorite shaper of all time? I think Mark Richards. I love the 20s. I love the history. My God, winning four with his own boards? That's just cool. Super cool. And the last question is a little bit unusual. I ask everyone on this show, please don't ask me why I came up with this question. I don't know. (laughs) Nevertheless, your best relationship advice when for relationship can be romantic relationship, relationship with the ocean, relationship with the friends, the way you want to answer this question, answer me, I just asked. I think it's about being really honest with yourself and being honest with the people around you um, about what's important to you, what you want, what you don't like. I mean, you can be way, you can be honest in ways that are kind, but showing up as your real self instead of just... When I moved to Hawaii, it's like it was so easy for me to be my surfer self in a way that was challenging in a flat water city and so all of my relationships got better because i felt more myself and i felt happier so i think it starts being honest about what you want yeah and then as the expectation are set then everything should go better right so we'll <laughs> at least yeah i didn't fly okay yeah. <laughs> yes and, and to, yeah the last final note please help us we met every criteria for the Paralympics. It's just the cost barrier that is the obstacle. Please help us with the petition. If you are independently wealthy and you want to help sponsor us for the Paralympics, we could really use the help. But more than anything, we want a chance to try to showcase to the world what parasurfers like me and like so many others can do in LA 28. Yes, definitely. We look forward for that. Uh, Victoria, thank you so much for being on the show with me today. And I look forward to hear from you very, very soon. Thank you. Ciao. Goodbye. Ciao. Hi, it's me again. I hope you enjoyed our today's episode. If you want to know more about us, please follow www.thetempleofsurf.com and all our social media. Mahalo.